And welcome to all of you. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Just like we start every episode, we like to give a little bit of love or a lot of bit of love uh, to our presenting sponsors. So thanks so much for all of you for not only uh, believing in us and supporting this conversation, but really our sector at large. So thanks so much to our presenting sponsors for allowing this national dialogue to continue on such a weekly basis. We now, did. Carrot, do I see some new logos or a new, new logo? Yes. Can figure out where they are. I know. Mission Met is our, our most recent. Absolutely. And some of these, Julia, they've been on since the beginning of, of our shows, like when we started it. And Brianna, I want to say that we are in episode like it's 220 something, 222. One, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, so we've been doing this uh, quite a bit and it's sure. just been amazing. So yes, thank you to all of our presenting sponsors. Um, and thanks to Julia for coming up with this amazing idea. Julia Patrick is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, that's me, the nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group, and just thrilled to be here alongside Julia as the co-host of The Nonprofit Show. Today's episode, I'm really excited because we've had Brianna's partner on with Abeja Solutions, and today we have Brianna on. I'm really excited uh, to have you. You are Chief Operating Officer, so COO at Abeja. Welcome to you, Brianna, and thanks so much for joining hello, us. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. As you can tell, I have a pandemic haircut. Uh, <laughs> that's what my hair normally looks like. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I just had Julia change out my photo because I too had a pandemic haircut and I was like, it doesn't look like me anymore. Yeah. It's the pandemic do. Yep. That's what yep. we have to call it. Well, we're really excited to have you here because we want to kind of have this major conversation that, that creates a lot of heartburn, I think, for many people in the nonprofit sector and just in business in general. Yeah. Talking oh, yeah. about direct mail strategies, but for 2021, because it's all gone wackadoo. And so we're super excited, Brianna, to, to find out what you think. And we're going to dive right in and we're going to ask you, is snail mail even relevant? Absolutely. Okay. Snail mail. <laughs> snail mail for nonprofits is still, it, it's still the big gorilla. It, mm -hmm. Digital and online social media, those are the cherries on top of your Sunday, but the real, real ice cream is with direct mail. Yeah. So take for example, that direct mail for a house list. So donors or people that you know at your nonprofit, your volunteers, uh, you know, former employees, if they left on a good, on good terms. So your house list is generally going to get a 5.1% response rate when you send mail. Now, okay. email has a 0.06% response rate. Oh so direct mail is 81 times more effective than email. And what, what makes email, though, seem to be the powerhouse is because it is fairly cheap. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying free. Yeah. It's fairly cheap. It still mm -hmm. costs you time and energy to produce those emails, mm -hmm. but you're going to expect a 0.06% response rate. So if you're trying to maximize your time and energy, direct mail is really where you want to focus. So when you say response rate, are you, are you calculating not just like the, the delivery rate and of email, the delivery and the open, but you're, you're actually talking about an execution. Yeah. So response, response rate, I'm talking very specifically about fundraising uh -huh. emails, not, we want you to call your legislator, not advocacy emails. Yeah. Those are all important. But mm -hmm. when you need to raise funds, mm -hmm. direct mail is your powerhouse. Mm -hmm. 
That doesn't mean you should ignore email or social media. Mm -hmm. If you include those as part of a larger integrated campaign, then you can actually increase your response rates to up to 27%. So a direct mail piece with a couple emails that are related to it Mm -hmm. and a fantastic landing page that is optimized for donations, 27% is the the response rate that you might be able to get. I'm literally taking notes, right? <laughs> in the end and I can't write fast enough. So good thing this is recorded. For all of you that are probably doing the same thing that I am, you can always go back to this recording. Um, so, so don't worry if you don't catch it all. Wow, are you a nerd and I love it. I am such a data nerd, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Tell us more about um, like how Abeja really works. Well, first of all, am I saying that right? Because I know it has a J in there. Yes. So Abeja is the Spanish word for bee. Um, so we we act uh, as your worker bees to get your direct mail done. Uh, it is hard. Emails, most everyone can send an email on you know, um, MailChimp or constant contact, right? It's Mm -hmm. the, the barrier for entry is fairly low. Um, direct mail though, uh, requires some knowledge of printing techniques of setting up your data list. So you can do mail merges effectively of if you're doing it in house, um, you know, how to, uh, avoid your printer, uh, deciding that it wants to do something else that day, right? <laughs> so direct mail is hard to execute. So with Abeja, we execute direct mail and just take that stress off of our nonprofit clients mm-hmm. back so they can focus on the things that they are good at. Calling, calling major donors so you can get a matching gift for your campaign, right? <laughs> That's also something that will increase your response rate is a matching gift. It doesn't matter how much it is. If it's a one for one for match, if it's, if it's a two match, if it's a thousand dollars or $10,000, it really doesn't matter. Matching gifts increase responses. Right. You know, and I think the matching gift concept is so magical for donors that, um, especially corporate partners that want to have some sort of marketing bump. You know, Mm -hmm. they want to get their name associated with this particular action or deed. And it is, it's just such a great way to um, continually reinforce who your partners are. And I do think, I mean, who hasn't been compelled by, you know, I, I think of public radio drives, you know, it's like this hour only, you know, we've got a matching, you know, pledge and does it, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. I think it speaks to um, the competitive nature of what we want to see our nonprofits do. It puts a time limit or time frame around an action. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's really a really good thing. When we talk about the, the, the actual aspect of getting a mailing out and it's a, it's a heavy lift, undoubtedly. Mm-hmm. It's a heavy lift. It scares away so many people. And a lot of times you can work so dang hard and then you're just like, okay, I did it for the year. But that's not really a good strategy, is it? A lot of organizations only do one mailing a year during giving season, right? Mm -hmm. That Thanksgiving, uh, a lot of food pantries, uh, organizations work on Thanksgiving. That is their major holiday. And then the Christmas season. Um, I know it's not uh, couth. There are many other holidays out there, but these are the largest, (laughs) these are the largest uh, times when people are opening their wallets. Mm -hmm. And But what will actually increase the response rate for your holiday mailer is to mail your donors throughout the year. We want to see, uh, I don't want to see as a donor, like you just pop up at random once a year. I want you to thank me and report back to me on what you're doing with my dollars. So 
oftentimes a newsletter is a excellent report reporting back mechanism and a mailed newsletter is important. Um, you can also do gratitude cards, things like that. Um, but you should be consistently asking your donors for money, thanking them, and whether that's the direct thank you note or just general thank yous, um, we have one client doing a massive Valentine's like spread the love event for their donors. Um, and then you want to report back. This is the program we were able to start, or this is how people have been affected. You know, I want to know that my money's going to a good cause. So then the next time that ask comes around, I feel really good about giving. Giving is an emotional decision, but, but we like to have backup, right? So I did make a good decision. I gave you $150 six months ago. And when you report back to me, a wonderful story about a woman who was able to get a house, you know, all those things, then I feel good about that gift. And I'm that much more likely to give again. Yeah. So with the question of how many times should you ask people, how many times should you mail people more than one, less than 21 and somewhere in the middle is a question mark. So, <laughs> Such an open ended. Yeah. You know, so Tom like, Ahern, Tom Ahern is a, is a uh, direct mail guru and he's done studies. Um, donors start to notice and get slightly annoyed with the number of appeals at the 21 plus mark. Yeah. So you're not asking enough. I guarantee unless you are the AS ASPCA, the Salvation Army, uh, you know, um, uh, What's the big rescue mission? I can't remember. Um, there are organizations that are definitely pushing that 20 plus boundary, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they do it because it works for them. Right. So the answer to how many mailings is what's in your budget? What are your objectives for the year? And how are you going to use mail to get there? So mm -hmm. we generally recommend at least four pieces, four pieces, um, two asks, two newsletters at a minimum that a spring appeal, a summer newsletter, um, summer doesn't work in Arizona very well, but depending on where you are in the nation, you know, find your seasonal things and get four pieces out, two asks and two report backs. And then of course your thank yous, however those get delivered, mm -hmm. um, start there and then see what your results are. Mm -hmm. And if asking more often is more effective for you, because what is the number one indicator that a donor will give again? It's the recency of their last gift. It's counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. You say, oh, well, these people, I, I hear, organizations say, well, we're going to suppress people that gave in the last 30 days. And I beg them, please don't, <laughs> please, please don't. Mm -hmm. For one, that appeal letter should also function as a communication, right? Yes, its primary goal is to ask for money, right. but it tells a story that I do want to hear as the donor. Right. This is how we are able to do great stuff with your money. And um, it's, it's likely that someone will, will give again. Right. And I, I love that you said the giving season and, you know, here we are the end of January, which I cannot believe it already, right? Moving into February <laughs> yeah. here shortly. Um, but the fourth quarter is typically that giving season. And that's typically when the, you know, 30% ish comes in by way of donations, financial contribution. Yep. 
So it's really big. And I do think, and both of you feel free to back me up or disagree on this, um, that we've really seen a higher level of generosity in 2020 over 2019. And again, we don't have a crystal ball, but what I'm hearing you Mm -hmm. say, uh, really, Brianna, is, you know, to continue these solicitations. So one is too few, 22 is too many, and somewhere in the (laughs) middle, find your happy place. Yes, absolutely. Find your happy place. And realize that, so going backwards in time, you know, March, March, April last year, uh, some organizations said, oh my goodness, thing, the world is crumbling. Right. We're going to cancel all of our asks. Everything. Right. We, right. Uh, yeah. And And it was really tough for some of our clients that chose to march ahead and say, Mm -hmm. you know what, we planned the work, we're going to work the plan and just trust that our donors will take care of us. Mm -hmm. And those that marched ahead and just kept on doing the work, they were really, really successful. I like to say, don't make decisions for your donors. Your donors always, always have the opportunity to say no. Mm-hmm. They, I, I, get, I get appeals all the time that I don't respond to. But I, if some message touches my heart and there isn't a response device in there, am I... Am I going to make the effort to handwrite the envelope to do that sort of stuff? So I always recommend like put the, put the ownership in the donor's hands, give them all the tools that they, they can use to respond and no, no judgment if they don't respond to that particular appeal. Right. And I like what you said that it's, it's always use it as a communication device. You know, it's not just about the ask, but it's also, you know, circling back, especially in this time of change. You know, what did we do as an organization to um, serve our community? How did we, you know, project what we thought should be needed? How did our clients respond to us? You know, where did we see opportunities? How did we marshal our community? And I think that's super positive. Absolutely. Super, super positive with the several organizations. So I'm, I'm a big data nerd. Uh, Everyone knows your stock portfolio should be diversified, right? Your retirement funds should be diversified is the exact same concept for your revenue, right? So um, what, what is your revenue pie look like? And how can you diversify that? So we saw in 2020, and it's gonna continue through 2021, a lot of organizations that were very event driven, Mm -hmm. golf, golf tournaments, galas, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, walks, all of those things. um, If they were too heavily weighted on event fundraising, they had a huge problem weathering the COVID struggle. Those that had, you know, 20% of their pie in events and a good, you know, chunk in corporate and individual giving, you know, like you want to diversify your portfolio a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, Those were able to better able to weather the storm, Mm -hmm. but you've lost several, you've, you've lost some communication channels in 2020 due to this pandemic, right? All of that in-person stuff is, is gone. And I know lots of organizations successfully did virtual fundraisers, you know, via Zoom, Uh, but they are just as much work on your organization as the physical gala, right? You have to think through them, uh, have entertaining bits and ask bits and all that sort of stuff. Um, But you can always rely direct mail is much easier than event fundraising. It's still complicated, um, but 
look at a look at a diversified portfolio and figure out where mail fits into that. Um, I wouldn't say go all in on direct mail. Don't go all in on radio ads. Don't go all yeah. in on even government funding, right? Some, we have some clients that have a lot of program revenue mm -hmm. from state and federal funds. And it's a, it's a little tough right now. Sure. I have a, a question and um, I've had the great opportunity to work with you and your partner, Laura, with Abeja, but I would love for you to nerd out a little bit and tell us just how important our donor database is to the success of our direct mail pieces. <laughs> I know this is like the witch's yeah. brew for you. Yes. Uh, data, data, data will tell you what you should focus on, right? Um, get the self a donor database. They aren't that expensive. Excel will, once you're past 50 people, get a database. Excel will drive you crazy. You can go to Little Green Light. It is $17 a month. It is so cheap and it is, it's, it works. There are plenty of other donor databases, mm -hmm. but with your donor data, you can see, okay, we have 500 people, 250 people. Mm -hmm. We, um, the board says we need to raise 20,000 this year in individual fundraising. What is the average gift size? Is that even a, a is that a reasonable goal or is that a huge stretch goal? I can't tell you that your organization is different, right? But if your average gift is a thousand dollars, multiply that by how many donors you have, your your retention rate, you know, and you can start looking at is the are these goals feasible? What what it no there's nothing in fundraising that is predictive. I can never predict what your results are going to be, but we can forecast. And forecasting reduces your stress. I know a lot of executive directors out there, directors of development. We all they need don't that. know they don't know what's around the corner. And yes, I cannot predict. Uh, 2020 has definitely taught, I think, a lot of us, especially me. You know what? Tomorrow is tomorrow. I cannot predict anything. <laughs> Right. That, is the truth. that is the truth. But having your data, so above 50, like really get off of note cards and Excel sheets and move into a little more robust uh, CRM or client relationship management platform so that you can be specific and yeah. really knowledgeable to forecast, not predict, forecast. Yes. Um, what your potential is. And I think, I think that's wonderful. Plus what I love and uh, Laura shared a lot in um, 2020 with us about the ask string. Yeah. And I have to make sure I really pronounce that K ask <laughs> <laughs> um, in the direct mail. Right. And that is, ex I, I think what you just shared, Brianna, it's like, you know, those donors that have given in, in the last 30 days, do ask them again. Don't pull them from your direct mail piece because the chances are they will give again. And those strings will really be customized because of the health and maturity of your donor database. Yeah. So I was just going to talk about the ask strings, Jared. So you're reading my mind. Um, that database allows you to pull like what was Brianna Clink's last gift? Mm -hmm. It was $150. Am I going to ask her for 35? No. Ask me for 170. Ask me for 165, right? You mm -hmm. want to retain your donors at the level that they're giving or upgrade them, right? Yeah. Don't ask for something that you know is below my giving level. Mm -hmm. It also allows you to look at households and save money too, right? A database that you can dedupe. So when, um, you know, a lot of us have multiple email addresses, yes. but our, our physical address is the same. And a database, <laughs> a database can help you, you know, it can handle the deduping. Like, 
hey, you know what? Is Jarrett Ransom over here the same as Jarrett Ransom over there? And now you can- are, yes. There's not a lot of Jarrett Ransom. I I also have a very uncommon name. (laughs) So I'm like, and there there are a few other Brianna Clinks. They don't have the De Ruiz on the end, but Brianna Clink, there are like six of us total in the United States. Um, And I'm related to all of them. Uh, (laughs) The third cousins, you know, twice removed, all that. But you can start seeing patterns over time. And the one thing I want to just tell every single nonprofit leader is you do not have all the time, energy, financial resources that you need to get your work done. Mm -hmm. So how do you focus your time and energy on the things that are going to return back to you? Mm -hmm. And data, I truly believe data can help you do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if there's a contentious um, board relationship, uh, no one has ever seen those before. (laughs) Uh, Boards are always (laughs) completely rational and have... (laughs) have have, uh, completely realistic expectations. But instead of going back and saying, let me give some examples. Um, A new executive director we've been working, he's he's been an ED in a lot of different places, but he joined an organization that was not a direct mail place. And he's like, I know, I know this works. So he was able to convince them to run a test and the data, we were able to say, okay, well, last year we did just a digital campaign for holiday. And this year we did a inter, um, a uh, direct mail, an integrated campaign with digital direct mail. Look at the results. It's very easy to convince board members with numbers, with 35,000 extra thousand dollars. Right. Um, even if that direct mail did cost you 4,000 to, to execute, um, that's, that's still significant. And you can always win arguments with data. (laughs) Um, well, not always, some people are very obstinate, but it, it's definitely going to help you. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I, and I think as we wind up, because this has just been amazing, um, you know, it's always, good to have this backup information. And as we move forward in this sector, data as Sasha Lewis from Moves Moves Management says, you know, data sexy and that's where the decisions are being made. You know, your funders, your C-suite, your board, this is the new reality. It's not Mm -hmm. as intuitive as we've used, we've been used to, you know, it's going to be more concrete. So um, we need to start looking at this Hey, Brianna Clink Dave Ruiz has been amazing. I want to say you're one of the queen bees of all this. Uh. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're really excited that you came and chatted with us today. Oh, it's a joy. Oh my gosh, especially at this time of the year when, you know, we're making plans moving forward. We still yeah. are, are so challenged by what 2021 might bring us. But the concept of putting this back on the radar of nonprofits brilliant. I literally had this question from an executive coach and client of mine this morning. She emailed and she said, Hey, for our next coaching session, let's talk about direct mail. How many should we do? What should the focus be? And I'm like, are you tuning into the show this morning? Because that's what I'm learning out about. So I agree, Julia, perfect timing. If you haven't looked up abejasolutions.com, please do. Brianna and Laura are amazing and will definitely guide you and your organization in the right direction direction to be successful yeah. for your goals. Yeah. And we, we have a lot, do check out our blog. We have a lot, we tell you what our secret sauce is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing secret that we do. I want you to be able to execute mail, whether it's through us or yourself. I have made all of the mistakes and I don't want you to make them. Please check out our content because it's very specific. Like buy this paper, make this, this is how you create your data list. 
This is how you don't pull out your hair when (laughs) you are stuck stuffing and, you know, printing and stuffing your own pieces. Oh my gosh. I love that. Well, Hey, it's so hard to believe that our time is up and with you, Brianna, do check out the Abeja um, Solutions website. Uh, Brianna's right. Um, that blog is amazing. I've learned a lot from it myself. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I've been joined by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom. Hey, we have a new thing that we're um, introducing only to the viewers of the nonprofit show. It's a $95 an hour uh, special rate just for nonprofit executive coaching. So check us out. We both are very different um, and we have limited availability, but we thought we'd go ahead and kick off the new year with this um, opportunity. You only know a good sailor in rough seas, one of the best lines ever. Again, we want to thank our presenting sponsors, including our new sponsor, Mission Met, that we just added today. We're super excited about them joining us. Again, the nonprofit show, we always like to end every episode with our mantra. Stay well. So you can do well. We're going to see you back here tomorrow.